Sheila Squilanti. I'm the MFA director. Um, and my job tonight is just facilitator. Um, I'm here to make sure that the tech works um, and to help you ask questions of our guest. Um, I just dropped my pen. Okay. So as you can see, as you can tell, probably you've all been muted. Um, that's that's on my side of things. I've muted everyone upon entry. Um, and that is not because I don't want to hear your voices, but it's because I don't want to hear dogs in the background. No, I'm kidding. I have dogs too. But it's just to minimize the background noise um, so that we can all focus on, on the content. Um, later in the program, there will be a way for you to, there's always actually going to be a way for you to contact uh, me. If you need to speak to me privately, there's a chat function. If you look at the bottom of your screen, um, there's a chat there. You can send a chat message that everyone in the group will see, or you can specify who you'd like the chat to go to. Um, at the end, sort of towards the middle-ish, uh, there will be time for questions. And what I'll ask, because this is a pretty big group, we've got 29 people in here right now, and we're expecting maybe even another 10. Um, I think what we'll do is have you ask your questions in the chat, and then um, I will either read them and Danielle will answer them or we'll see how that goes. We'll be a little bit flexible with that, okay? So um, I'm gonna stop, we are recording this, just FYI and total transparency for everybody. Um, and uh, Joe Bashadi, our program assistant, is also present in this space. So if you have um, a tech question or some other kind of question, you can also reach out to him during the session. Um, I am now going to introduce our guest this evening. I'm very happy to have her here. She is a powerhouse uh, person, human in the Pittsburgh literary scene. Her name is Danielle Chiotti, Um, and I'm going to read you her, her bio, and then I'll let her say more about who she is. Danielle Chiotti has worked in publishing for 18 years. Formerly an editor, she joined Upstart Crow Literary, uh, literary Agency. Um, uh, when it was founded in 2009, specializing in young adult and middle grade fiction, as well as cookbooks and select nonfiction. Thanks to her extensive editorial background, she enjoys working closely with authors to develop projects. She welcomes first time authors with a unique voice and point of view. She also cooks and she's just, she's got great taste in lipstick. I don't know, she's great. Um, so she's going to share her, her very specific industry. Um, knowledge with us tonight. We're very, very lucky to have her here. Um, and I'm going to shut up now and let Danielle talk. All right. Thanks, Sheila. I appreciate it. Thanks. Hi, everybody. It's really nice to see all of your faces. Thanks for coming out to uh, hang out with me tonight and talk about query letters and publishing and literary agents. So as Sheila said, I'm an agent with Upstart Crow literary agency. Um, I've been doing that for almost 18 years now and prior to that I was an editor first in Boston and then in New York. Uh, so during this 18 year span I've worked on a wide variety of books, um, nonfiction, fiction, fiction for children, nonfiction for children, fiction for adults, just the, the whole gamut. I've done a lot of it um, and in that time I've had the chance to read a lot of query letters. And I've had a chance to write a lot of query letters and I spend a lot of time thinking about query letters and thinking about how important query letters are for all of you writers who are maybe looking for a literary agent because a literary agent is basically your first step on the road to publication, especially if you're interested in publishing with a, a traditional publishing house, usually editors at publishing houses will want you to have an agent first and have the agent be the liaison between the, uh, the author and the publisher. So that is my job, which is multifaceted. Um, and the way that you catch an agent's attention is to write them a great query letter. And so that is what we are here to talk about tonight. Um, it is my opinion that other than your manuscript, your query is one of the most important written documents that you will produce in your writing career. And since I've been doing this for a long time, I have seen how far reaching a well-written query can be. It, a query has very long legs. So say you are an unpublished author and you are querying me. 
uh, for your project and I like you and I sign you. When I go to pitch your projects to editors, which I do all the time, I have to write query letters too. I don't necessarily like it. I find it difficult. It's a different set of muscle memories um, and you need to use a lot of different tricks to kind of wrap your mind around how to do it. And we're going to talk a lot about that tonight. At any rate, I might use pieces from your query letter when I'm writing my query letter to an editor. When the editor falls in love with your book and says to her company, I have to publish this book, let's publish this book, and you get a book deal, the editor will often take the copy from my query letter and insert it into the publisher's marketing copy. And it might even make its way onto the jacket of your final published book. So a query letter that you wrote on your computer that lived in a Word document for many, many years might end up being copy on the jacket of your book if you do it the right way. Those words stick around and the words matter. So we're gonna to talk today about how to use the words, right? So I know that when you first imagine writing a query letter and you think, how am I going to whittle down my beautiful, fantastic book, which is tens of thousands of words long into a one page document that has basically a 220 word summary. How are you supposed to do that? It seems like an impossible task, but it's really not an impossible task if you follow the steps I'm going to give you today. Just like you've been studying the craft of writing, query letter writing is a craft in and of itself. And once you have the tools to do that, you can develop the muscle memory to make that happen. So we're going to do a lot of things today. We're going to talk about um, the four main elements of a successful query letter. We're going to talk about how to write a good hook and then how to use that hook to write a good summary in your query letter. Uh, we're going to look at examples of effective query letters. We're going to look at examples of ineffective query letters. Um, hopefully we'll have some time for a Q&A session and then we can do some workshopping for anyone who wants to try their hand at using their newfound knowledge of writing a hook or writing a summary uh, and we can read those out loud and workshop them a little bit. So hopefully we'll have time to get to all of that today. And I would love, before I launch into my, my PowerPoint presentation, I'd love to get a sense from all of you if you have any experience with query letters at all. So if anyone has experience, give me like a thumbs up or a wave or something. I've got one thumb, let's see. Wow, okay. Oh good, we've got lots of newbies here. And then a thumb up, and I like that. So, so there's always something new to learn and no matter if you've never done it before or if you've done it before there will be something here for you so what I'm going to do now is share my lovely PowerPoint on the screen I'm new at zoom so bear with me and um, and I'm gonna run you through this this process let's see sharing okay let's get it in the right view there we go so the class is writing the query letter uh, that gets you noticed. Um, as I mentioned, writing queries is really hard. It can be super frustrating and scary. I feel like this sometimes when I write queries. You might feel this way too. Again, like I said, you're trying to whittle down a very large body of words into a very tiny body of words that does a lot of heavy lifting. Uh, and it's very important. There's a lot riding on it but we're going to look at easy ways to make that happen for you today. So how do we get you to write a query to, that gets an agent to pick you, right? How do you say, pick me, pick me to an agent? Before we dive in to the nitty gritty of how to write a query letter, I wanna talk about some basics first. <laughs> Before you can write a query letter, you have to have written a manuscript. That manuscript has to be in tip top shape. That's the first order of business. If it's not in tip top shape, I would advise you not to query because if you're not ready that could mean the difference between um, uh, an acceptance letter from an agent saying I'd like to read the full or I'd like to offer you representation or a rejection. The next thing is that you should write a query letter that is brief, clear, and simple. I am a traditionalist when it comes to query letters. You don't encourage a lot of bells and whistles because I want you to give any agent or considering editor a deep understanding of who you are and who your protagonist is and what their story is. Or if you're writing nonfiction, what is truly special about your project. Number three seems silly and like a no-brainer. 
Um, but it will become important later in this discussion, and I will give you an illustrated example. But number three is put the title of the project in the subject line of your email. Again, I know that seems really simple, but you would be surprised at how many people don't do it. And when I give you a glimpse into my inbox later, I think that you'll see why it's important for it to be in all caps, right? So is your book really, truly ready to go? And as I mentioned, querying before you're ready means the difference between a request and a rejection, right? So is it ready? Well, has your book been through at least several drafts? Not draft one or two, but maybe into draft three or four? Has it been vetted by beta readers and critique group, right? Have you polished it to a high shine? And have you taken it as far as you possibly feel like you can take it? And not in the meh kind of way, like, ah, it's good enough, but oh, I actually, I have reached the threshold of my ability and it is as good as I can humanly make it when you feel that way about your manuscript and also probably pretty sick of it, that is the time to get it off of your desk and to start sending it out to people. So there are different rules for fiction and nonfiction. And I think we have a mix of people um, here tonight. So I wanna talk a little bit about how it works between fiction and nonfiction. When you're querying with fiction, you must have a complete manuscript written. That means it has to be done, finished ready to go. Um, if you query agents when you have a partial manuscript, chances are you're going to get a note back that says, thanks so much, please contact me again when the manuscript is finished. Um, it's just very difficult to sell a fiction manuscript on a partial. Even when there are authors who have previous book deals and who have a strong sales track record, it can be a difficult road to try to sell something on a partial. So always have a fiction manuscript complete, especially if you're a debut author. Nonfiction is a little bit of a different um, road. You don't need to have the whole thing written. You can do several sample chapters, very strong sample chapters, plus a full book proposal, which could be a whole other class in and of itself, which would include an overview, publicity, marketing, and competitive titles. Um, I'm going to say some things in the course of this class that are contradictory between fiction and nonfiction, and what works for one doesn't always work for the other. They'll, they'll butt heads occasionally. And so if you have questions about that at the end during Q&A, we can, we can hash that out a little bit. Publishing is not a business that makes a lot of sense, um, but I'm here to try to hopefully help you make some sense of it. Okay. One last thing. Break the mold with your manuscript, not with your query. That means that as you're experimenting with your query, you may feel inclined to use bells and whistles or gimmicks to get my attention. Uh, people do this a lot. They try to bribe me with cookies. They tell me that they're going to once they're going to make me rich and invite me to their summer houses. They one time I had someone write me a query letter that was written as though the protagonist of the book was pitching me the book. And then I had another person write me a query letter that had a short story in it with me as the protagonist, and it didn't have anything to do with the book at all. And I don't know why they were doing that. Um, point being. I don't remember what any of those books was about. <laughs> I only remember what gimmicks people used to try to get my attention. So I remember the gimmicks, but not the stories. And again, this is where we come back to simplicity being your friend. I don't need you to try to impress me with bells and whistles. I just need you to impress me with your awesome book and your awesome self. One last thing, going back to the title, it's clickbait. So I took a screenshot of my inbox so you can take a look at what my inbox looks like. I have about 500 emails like this in my inbox right now going back from about the last month and a half. Each of them has a 20 page writing sample attached to it. Um, it's a lot of reading. So I pick reading days and I go in and I pick a day and I read, right? So your eyes kind of glaze over when you're scrolling through pages and pages and pages of this stuff. So when you're looking at it, what pops out at you? Beside being at the top of the page, I'm looking at Tendog because it's in all caps. I can see it. And I'm, What's Tendog? That sounds cool. I'll read Tendog. And I'm also looking down here at Deja Ortega. That sounds cool. She's an odds breaker. I want to know what's going on with that. New novel query? Not so much. I mean, I, I don't understand what that is. It's, it's, it doesn't say anything to me. Now, that doesn't mean that it's not going to get read. All of these are going to get read, but I'm going to click on something that's more interesting first. And when you're one of many, 
you want to put your title in there. Your title, you probably worked hard to think of your title. Put it in the subject line of your email. It, it gives you a leg up, a leg up for sure. Okay, finally, we can get to query stuff, which is four essential elements of a query with a bonus random cat photo because cats are cute and PowerPoints are boring. <laughs> so um, the four major elements of a query are your opening, your hook, and your summary. And your hook and your summary are interesting. They're like this duo that's like married, but they live apart or something. Like, like your hook and your summary won't necessarily be separate elements in your query letter, but you will build the hook first in order to build a successful summary. And I'll show you how to do that pretty soon. And then there's the author bio and the closing paragraph. Um, so these are the four essential elements of any good, simple, clear query. And we'll break down each one right now with examples. So the opening should include the following. A greeting, like hi, how are you? Uh, the title, preferably in all caps. The genre and the word count. So greeting, title, genre, word count. And um, I'll give you an example of what that looks like here. I have two, uh, two different openings, um, one for a middle grade novel and one for an adult literary historical novel. Notice each has the title in all caps, each has the word count, um, and each has the category that's going on. Now, should you personalize the greeting, meaning say something nice to the agent? You can, and that's fine, as long as it feels organic. Um, say you've read an interview with that literary agent and you really liked their point of view. Say that agent represents writers that you're totally fangirling or fanboying out over and you really admire their client list. It's okay to say that um, to an agent as long as you can do it in an organic way. As you can see, the second uh, opening here says that it, it's been recommended to me by a friend, um, a publishing friend of mine, Johnny Temple, who runs an indie press out of Brooklyn called Akashic Books. And if you guys aren't familiar with them, look them up because they publish some really cool stuff. They do some great stuff. Um, so that's what your opening should look like. Pretty simple. And just as a point of interest, the top, the top opening is the opening um, for a novel that I ended up signing last fall and then selling last fall in a two book deal to Houghton Mifflin Harcourt. Um, and the title is now called uh, Just Write Jillian and it will be out in fall of 2021. So, <sighs> dreams do come true in book publishing occasionally. Okay, moving on to the hook or the log line or the elevator pitch, whatever you want to call it. This is where it all starts. This is the most important part. Um, of building your summary and building a query letter that gives me, the agent, a sense of your character's arc and what they're up against that allows me to dive into the story with confidence, right? There is a really great formula that I like to use that I totally stole from another author named K.M. Wyland uh, that tells you how to craft this elevator pitch. And I'm going to show it to you right now. This is for fiction. We'll talk about nonfiction in a minute. Um, a protagonist must do something that sets up a climactic encounter with an antagonist. That's it in a nutshell. If you're writing fiction, you want to try to do those things for your story, right? Um, the, I used an example below. A spirited farm boy joins a rebel army to save a princess from evil forces and to save the galaxy from a planet destroying starship. Uh, which hopefully you will recognize as the hook of Star Wars. Uh, if it's good enough for the most iconic movie of all time, it is definitely good enough for your book. So this hook formula is something that we're going to be using um, in the workshop, and I will bring it up again later so we can talk a little bit more about it then. Once you've got your hook down, you can use that to build your, uh, your summary. And let's talk a little bit, though, about nonfiction hooks 
before we move on. So generally there are two different types of nonfiction or major categories of nonfiction that we're going to be dealing with. One is narrative or memoir and one is more informational nonfiction. If you're dealing with the narrative or memoir, you could probably plug in your memoir story to that hook uh, formula I was just giving you. You're the protagonist in your own story. You're up against things. You can use that to your advantage. Um, there's no reason you shouldn't give that a try and see what it yields for you. Um, when we're looking at informational nonfiction, maybe something that's a biography or a food history or something like that, a cookbook, whatever it may be, the main thing is to emphasize what makes your book unique, what makes it stand out in the marketplace. So here is a little write-up on examples of what would make a nonfiction book unique. And I pulled examples from projects of mine that I've that I've sold. So, you know, my book is the first book to provide a personal account of oyster farming from a farm to table perspective, right? Or it's the first cookbook to look at um, New England cuisine as a region and wants to elevate New England cuisine just like Southern cuisine has been elevated. Um, or the first guidebook on co-parenting after divorce written by a divorced couple uh, who co-wrote the book together. Find ways to say, this is something that's never quite been seen before, right? This is something that's new, that's fresh, um, and that's different for a reader. So that is how you differentiate when you're, when you're trying to hook your nonfiction project. So getting fancy with the hook, meaning doing comps. Right? Should you compare your book to other books? Should you compare it to other movies? A lot of people do this in their queries. There are entire Twitter pitch contests that are built on this principle. I am of the mind that it works well for Twitter and that it doesn't work so well when you're writing a query letter. I actually think that when you're querying cold, it can put you, the author, at a disadvantage. Um, and even though using comps can be tempting or using a mashup can be tempting, right? Saying, oh, it's like the perks of being a wallflower meets the Gilmore Girls. It sounds really great. The thing that I worry about with that is that it, it creates a set of expectations that your writing sample might not live up to. Not because your writing sample is not good, but because it's so subjective, right? You, you don't know what, what experiences any one reader is bringing to this. So what I would say to you is, unless the comp or the mashup is kind of so of the moment um, that you can't pass it up, if it's so current that you, you just can't sleep at night knowing that you didn't mention it in your query, then go ahead and use it. But if it's, if it's not, if you're second guessing it, I would urge you to err on the side of caution and not do that at all. Um, because because it's it, it just opens you up to pitfalls as an agent i would rather hear you tell me straight from your heart and your mind what you feel makes your book special what makes your character tick what makes your book tick rather than relying on the work of someone else i want to know it straight from you um, other agents may have different opinions and you could probably talk to 15 different agents and they'll give you 15 different opinions, but this 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 agent's opinion. Um, I also think that part of the reason this staying traditional works better is because agents and editors are the experts at what's going on in the marketplace. So as your agent, if I like your project, I'm probably going to find a way to comp it that is current that I can use to sell it to an editor. Um, so kind of let the agents and editors do that expert work for you and and don't trouble yourself about it too much. Um, next, the summary. We're going to build off of your hook. There are rules for a summary. It should be five to ten sentences long. It should be 220 words max. And I know that 220 words sounds super short, but I'm going to show you some examples of query letters and you'll see just how long it looks when it's on someone's screen. And if you can, for fiction, no spoilers, right? You don't want to necessarily spoil. You want to leave them hanging, kind of like you do in jacket copy. If you pull any book off of the shelf and read it, they never tell you how it ends. Don't do that in your query letter either. So five to 10 sentences long, 220 words max, no spoilers. And if you can keep it around 200 words in the summary, even better. Um, and to clarify, the summary is only 
the paragraph or two that explains what the project is. I'm not saying that the whole letter has to be 220 words, but the summary portion of the letter has to be 220 words. Um, let's see, what do I have next? Ah, to write a summary for fiction, you want your summary to answer these four very important questions. And if you pull any book off of your bookshelf and look at the jacket copy, you will see that the copy basically answers these four questions. Who is your protagonist? What do they want? What conflict is standing in their way? And what are the stakes of their final battle? Everybody has a final battle, even if it's a quiet battle, it doesn't have to be car explosions and chases and things like that. Everybody has a final battle, right? So we want to illustrate that in your summary. And I will give that to you in an um, example. So I pulled up a couple of examples and I pulled out to the side here, highlighted what questions they answer, right? So here's one example of a fiction query. Um, who is the protagonist? It's a young woman named Freniker, right? Um, what does she want? She wants freedom. Um, what conflict is standing in her way? Um, a friendship that is threatening to spill over into romance. And what are the stakes of the final battle? Uh, a, a confrontation with her father and also dealing with this, this friendship romance transition. So that is what a summary looks like. And let me see, I ran a word count on this. This summary is 91 words long. And it still looks long on the screen. So imagine how long 220 looks. This is 90, 91 words. Here's another fiction example. Uh, this is for an adult, uh, adult project of mine. Um, so who is the protagonist? It's Marcus Hayes, right? What does he want? Well, he kind of wants to beat people up. <laughs> and he also wants the love and acceptance of a young woman that he's fallen in love with. Um, what's standing in his way? His demons, right? And what are the stakes of his final battle? Kind of getting on a path of redemption that allows him to face up to his demons and have a happier life. It's quiet, but this is a riveting, wonderful novel. Um, and this the word count on this is 145, 145 words. Uh, so that's fiction. And if we're going to look at some nonfiction, again, we want it to have a compelling description of the narrative or the subject matter. We want it to tell us what makes your book unique. And we want it to show the target readership, meaning who will buy this book and why. And this is where that information might run a little counter to me telling you don't comp your fiction to anything, <laughs> right? It may be okay to comp your nonfiction to something if you can establish that there's a fan base for it because nonfiction publishing works on marketing. If your wonderful nonfiction manuscript makes it into a publisher's editorial meeting, that means the person who read it loves it. And that means that they are going to spend absolutely no time talking about the merits of your writing when it makes it to editorial, when, when, it's, when it's nonfiction. When it's nonfiction, they're only going to talk about how marketable it is and what the audience is. It's not sexy and it's not romantic, but it's absolutely true. Fiction is different. They talk about the writing. Nonfiction, the writing, if it makes it to a meeting, we know that we love the writing. So talking about what makes the book unique, talking about the target readership is super important. And here is an example of that right your compelling description is that erin ditched her pampered editor job to go work on an oyster farm and get dirty for like 18 months right um what makes it special it's the first book to provide an, a first person account of a farm to table oyster experience and the target readership there are some comp titles there right and this is an old query so these are these are older uh older comps, but, but again, you want to prove what your audience is. You want to prove that there's a, an audience that's hungry for this type of book, who will buy more of this type of book. And here's another example from a cookbook that I'm working on. Um, again, what's compelling? Well, what's compelling is that Aria was taught old school Malaysian cooking techniques by her mother, but she lives in Brooklyn. So she combines that with her, her cool Brooklyn vibe. And that's totally different and totally new. Um, and the target readership is for fans of a book called Korean Home Cooking, books that bas basically take you on a narrative journey into another culture in a book. So, so whatever it is for your book, 
you'll have to be a researcher and you'll have to figure that out. Um, when you say there's nothing like it, people tend to not believe you. So find something, find something uh, that makes that work. Okay, moving on to the author bio portion of the query letter. Um, the author bio, my message doesn't vary. Keep it very simple, keep it short and sweet. If you have previous publications, books or literary journals, list them. If you do not, please do not fret. Um, no one is going to not read you because you're a first time author. Um, people love first time authors. Publishers love first time authors. Agents love first time authors because you don't have a sales track record that is bad. <laughs> and publishers hate bad sales track records. You're totally new and they can, they can build you any way they want. So don't be afraid to say, this is my first novel, or this is my debut novel. Don't apologize, even though this is my first novel. Don't do that. Just say, this is my debut. Be proud of your debut. It, it's, it's a good thing. It's definitely a good thing. Same thing for awards or accolades. If you have them, include them. If you don't, that's okay. Affiliations, same thing. There are lots of organizations. Are you a member of RWA, which is Romance Writers of America? Are you a member of SCBWI, which is the Society for Children's Book Writers of America? Um, if you have any affiliations with local or national chapters, those are good things to put uh, in your bio and any workshop attendance. Um, if you studied with anybody who's famous or who mentored you, always good things to mention. Again, not going to make a difference if you don't have those things. And so here's an example of an author bio that's fairly simple. Someone with a BA in English, they did an internship with a small publishing company. This is their first novel. That's all you need. And then here is another example of someone with a little more street cred uh, who has a first novel that's already been published that also won an award, which is a good selling point. Um, and she's working on a screenplay of the book. So that, uh, that's an example of someone with a little more, um, with a little more experience. But again, don't, don't be afraid of, of not having experience. Don't apologize. I think Julia Child always said that about cooking too. Don't apologize. Just put it out there and roll with it. It's fine. So the closing part of your, um, of your query letter, uh, again, keep calm and uh, keep it simple. All you have to do is thank the agent or editor for their consideration and mention what portion of the manuscript is attached. This is going to vary <laughs> from submission to submission. Um, some of you have probably submitted to literary journals. I'm sure that you know maybe what that's like. Everybody has a different protocol. Everybody has different uh, different rules. The publishing industry is exactly the same way. Nothing is systematized. Every literary agency has its own set of guidelines and its own set of quirks and unfortunately you have to read all of them and know exactly what they want from you. Um, my company, for example, takes the first 20 pages of your your project and we consider those. Some agencies, I think, don't take any sample pages at all. They, they judge based on a query and then if they like the query, they'll ask for more. Some work on five pages or 10 pages. Everything is different, but following the submission guidelines um, puts you in the good graces of an agent. So make sure you read their, their submission guidelines and, and follow those. And I'll give you a couple of examples. Or I think one example here of a very uh, simple sample clothing. It's, it's very bare bones and that's fine. Again, you don't need to do anything too special because the specialness is going to come from your summary and the specialness is going to come from your hook and it's going to get me excited to scroll down and start reading those 20 pages, right? What I want is to know the arc of your character so I can dive in. So I'm going to show you a couple of examples of successful queries and then maybe some not so successful queries. So here's an effective query. This you've seen earlier from um, earlier in the in the in the talk, uh, the Book of Bravery. This query uh, came to me directly from the author. Again, the summary here is a one hundred and ninety eight words. So the summary is. Uh, I don't know if I can click on this. No, I can't hide. Oh, 
I can't highlight it. Oops, let me go back. I can't highlight it, but the summary is one, two, three paragraphs long. It's only 198 words, but look how big it is on your screen. So think of how big 220 looks on the screen, right? But you'll see what she's, what she's got going on here. We've got the title in all caps. We've got the category. We've got the word count. We've got our summary, which lets us know what our character's up against. And then we've got her bio, which is affiliations and what she does in her personal life, right? She gives a little kind of passion statement, and, and which, is, which is lovely and wonderful. Um, it was a very, very strong query. Let's see, here's an example of an ineffective query. Now, if you look at them, I'll flip back and forth. They don't, at first glance, <laughs> they don't look so different. They're kind of a lot of paragraphs, a lot of stuff going on. But if you dig into the content of this query, you'll see that it meanders. Um, the word count is kind of buried at the bottom. Uh, <laughs> this is her ninth novel in three years, so clearly she's prolific, uh, which is fine. Um, but but it, what this doesn't do is give me a hook. It doesn't allow me to truly understand the narrative arc of the story. When I read this query, I stopped reading halfway through, and I scrolled down and started reading the sample chapter instead, because it became evident to me that this query wasn't going to tell me what I needed to know about the character. Um, it, it, it meanders and we don't get a sense of story arc from this query. So when I get a query like that, I don't stop reading the entire submission. I just scroll down and take a look at the writing sample. There are plenty of people who write horrible queries and write absolutely gorgeous <laughs> manuscripts. So you don't get at least kicked out of my inbox for writing a terrible query. But uh, if you can write a good one, uh, that's even better. All right. So we can do um, we can do some Q and A and then dive into a workshop if that works. Okay. Danielle, do you want to um, stop sharing your screen, or I, do you want me to have have people write into the chat and I can just ask the questions for you? Um, yeah, that's fine. I I'm, I think we're going to leave the screen up because I'm okay. going to use it again. If okay. That's okay. Mm -hmm. So then I'm going to read a question. Uh, the first one that came in is from Mel De Stefano. Uh -huh. um, and the question is, how would we adapt the fiction elevator pitch to short stories where there isn't an overall plot? Mm -hmm. That's a great question. Um, short stories can be trickier. If there's a, usually books of short stories have some kind of overarching theme to them. So I would encourage you to work with that overarching theme um, and try to use that as the pitch. So I don't know that a book of short stories would fit into that protagonist antagonist stakes and final battle uh, because because there are many protagonists in the story so in that case i would encourage you to rely heavily on the themes it's a it's a group of short stories that explores themes of whatever it might be um, i recently sold a, a book of essays from local writer actually brian broom and um and so we couldn't tell what each essay was about but we sold it by saying this is a group of essays that explores gay black masculinity in the rust belt right and we and we hooked it that way so try to think about the time and place of the stories is there a similarity there what themes are you dealing with and are they personal to you and and try to work with it that way great Okay, the next question is from Zulika. Are there books you would recommend on writing a nonfiction book proposal? A nonfiction book proposal. I'd need to think on that and I can I can maybe email you, Sheila, and, and tell you off the top of my head, no, but I know that they're out there. Mm -hmm. I also think that even putting books aside, there are lots of great resources online. There are lots of fiction, uh, nonfiction book proposal templates that mm -hmm. you can look at out there. Um, I would also encourage you to go look at Jane Friedman, F -R yeah, Jane's yeah. great, right? Yeah. And, and she's a wealth of information. You might even be able to find everything you need on a nonfiction book proposal on Jane's site without ever buying a book. So I would definitely look at, at that. And there are lots of web resources, but let me look and see what I can find and I can email that answer to you, Sheila. Great. The next question is from Abigail Allen. How would you recommend approaching genre with a novel that has crossover appeal? For example, my novel is a YA novel but deals with heavier topics. Mm -hmm. 
So you can say it is a 75,000 word YA novel with crossover appeal and do, and do it exactly that way. Um, and, and that should be fine. And you might want to address a little bit about what the issues are, um, but, but I get plenty of pitches that say that this is a novel with crossover appeal. Um, or if it's YA and it skews a little older, you can say that it's a, it's a, a YA for older audiences with crossover appeal. Great. Okay, next question is from Rachel Kaufman. What advice do you have about children's book queries? Should they be similar to fiction queries? Absolutely, yes. Follow everything that, and I'm, th I'm guessing by children's books you mean full-length children's books. It, it doesn't matter if it's a picture book or a, a full-length middle grade novel or a YA novel. Yes, the, the, um, all of these query rules apply for children's books. Awesome. Okay, this is a question from Dan Reed Miller, uh, which came to me privately, but I think is for you. Uh, it is a three point, three part question. Okay. One, so for fiction, even though you need to have the full manuscript finished, agencies will only want their specified page count attached to the initial query? Correct, that's okay. correct. So, they, so you'll have to have the whole thing finished, but they only want you to send five or 10 or 20 pages to start. Okay, number two. Where did you say the passion statement goes? I think that it's fluid. Um, I kind of like it at the end, but you could also put it in your opening if you wanted to. But I, I tend to like it at the end if you can kind of mix it with your bio, because then you're talking about who you are and mm -hmm. why you love the book and why you feel the book is important. Nice. Um, Dan's last question is, will you send the PowerPoint to us? Sure. That's also Leanne's question. Hers is yeah. the next one up. <laughs> yeah, I can do that. I can send the PowerPoint. Thank you. Um, a question from Anna Nelson. In the previous publications section of the author bio, would it be of benefit to mention creative freelance writing projects? Does that mean, um, does that mean content created for someone else if so let me put it this way if it's content created for someone else maybe not so much but yes i mean if you have written something and had it published in a in a journal or online somewhere then that's definitely worth mentioning i hope i'm answering that oh let's see yeah. we'll let we'll let anna come back ask okay. and respond to that if she wants to okay. but I, i'll keep going for now okay. um Actually, Maria sends a nice uh, resource on Jane Friedman to the whole group. You should all click on that. It's uh, Jane Friedman, start here, how to write a book proposal. There you go. She's the best. Yeah, she is. Jane is the best, yeah. Um, okay, question from Johnny Caputo. My novel project utilizes two protagonists. Should I write separate hooks slash summaries for both protagonists or include descriptions of both protagonists in a single hook and summary? That is a great question, and it differs from book to book depending on how you are handling it. Um, if, if one of the protagonists has more of an arc, you could focus on them more and focus on their arc and maybe mention that it's a dual protagonist story. Uh, but if both of them have a very, very strong arc, then you've got a heavier load to lift because you've got to try to uh, encapsulate both of those arcs in your 220 <laughs> words have fun uh, no but it but it can but it can be done and i i've seen it done you'll just have to really whittle down those four questions right um and and try to get to them as as briefly as you possibly can and, and i've seen some people split it up between two paragraphs so you know um character x is battling against his inner demons but meanwhile character y is a happy-go-lucky this and that person. So, so you can definitely do it, um, but you'll have to be, it, it's, it's double duty for sure. But I, I see it done all the time. And okay, we have a question from Julie. Uh, what is a passion statement in a query? Is this also for nonfiction? It can be, yeah. I think that you don't necessarily need a passion statement, but I think we had, right, um, a couple of people who, who put it in. Sometimes people will talk about, why they've written about a certain subject matter, right? Why I think that that uh, Nicole in her query letter was mentioning that that she wants to give shy kids a chance, right? She sees the shyness and that was her mission. That was her passion. Um, I, I recently read a query that was about a, a child with ADHD and the 
and the writer was a mother of a child with ADHD and also an ADHD educator. So they mentioned that this is this is a subject matter that I'm particularly passionate about. I want to make sure that this group of, of children sees themselves represented in literature. Um, so, so that's kind of what a passion statement looks like as it would apply to your your project. It, it, you don't always need one. And I, I, I wouldn't recommend saying, you know, I loved writing since I was five and I'm really excited about writing a novel. I wouldn't put that passion statement in, but if it's, if it's project specific and it, it taps into something that's going on culturally in the moment, then a passion statement can be helpful. Great. Um, okay, we have a question from Abigail. Other than poor qu query letters, why do you usually reject projects? That's an excellent question. Thank you for that question. Um, I reject them for a lot of different reasons. Sometimes I reject a project because the query letter is good and the writing is very bad. <laughs> um, sometimes I reject a project because it is coming at the tail end of a trend that's trending downward and I worry that there's not enough room in the marketplace for it. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I reject a project because um, I have something else on my list that is similar and my list is not so big and I, uh, and I can't, I, feel, I don't want the projects to cannibalize one another. So sometimes I have to say no to something that I really like. And, and there are times that I, that I say no to something that I like. I don't always just say no to something that I, that I'm not into. Um, and, and this opens up the door for me to say something that I, that I like to talk about with anybody uh, who's, who's querying. And that's second books or second projects, right? If you're writing a book that could potentially be a series, I would advise you not to write the second book in the series until you have completed or sold, sorry, until you have sold the first book in the series. Uh, the reason that I say that is because your creative time is incredibly precious. And if the first book has not sold, then how are you going to sell the second book? Then you have another 60 or 80,000 word manuscript that, that you might not be able to place. And I like to use that as an example of me saying maybe no to somebody, but loving their writing. Uh, this just happened last week where I read a novel and I thought that the voice was so very good, but it, it just was, it was missing a little something in a category that's growing increase, increasingly tougher. And, um, I, but what I said to that writer was, I love your writing, what else do you have? Are you working on anything else? Because if you are, I'd like to see it when it's ready. And um, so if you've written a book that's the first in a series and I say, you know what, I can't take this on. Uh, but do you have anything else? Because I'd really love to read more of what you've written. And you say, I have book two in the series, then, I can't do, I can't read that, right? But if you have another book that's completely separate from that, the, from the book in the series, then we can keep a conversation going. And interestingly enough, that's exactly what happened with Nicole Collier, uh, the book of bravery that we've been looking at. She had actually queried me earlier about another project that I, it wasn't quite there. And I said, I love your work. Whenever you have something else, send it along. And she did. And that's how that worked out. So again, use of your precious creative time. Write an outline of the second book in the series. Write a summary of the second book in the series, but differentiate and write the next project that's not the book in the series if you haven't sold the first, because it increases your chances of getting an agent interested in your work and keeping them interested in your work. Speaking of precious time, I want to be mindful of ours. Um, it's 7.51 right now, and there are still several questions in the chat. Okay. How do you want to use the time in terms of workshop? Yeah, let's do a couple more questions and then we'll do some hook, maybe some hook writing and then people can share. Does everyone feel into trying some hook writing? Are we yeah, into that? Yeah. Excellent. Okay, so, cool. How about if we do uh, three more questions yeah. and then anyone whose question was not answered, I'm sure I'm, I'm going to go out on a limb here and say you can send that question to Danielle yep. via email and I'm sure she will answer it. Yeah. Okay. Yes, that's totally fine. I'm happy okay. to do that. Mm -hmm. uh, so the next question is from Maria Reynolds Weir. I'm writing a memoir that is cross is cross genre, incorporating poetry storytelling like Jacqueline Woodson as well as fiction. Yes. Tips on how to sell something cross genre. Mm -hmm. Well, I think that in this case, using the comp 
will be your friend because you can say it combines uh, the poetry elements, the poetry and narrative elements of a book like Jacqueline Woodson. And I think that that is A-OK -okay to do in a situation like that, where you are combining different elements and you also want to point to something that is uh, successful in doing that and that has good numbers. So, so you use that comparison um, in that particular case. Did I lose you? Did you lose me? No. Can you hear me? Okay. 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 Uh, next question is from Ali Resnick. I know this is jumping ahead, but I'm curious. If a literary agent accepts your proposal, is the expectation that you pay them up front, or is the expectation that the cost becomes part of what you've paid when the manuscript is sold to a publisher? Yes, that's a great question and part of another lecture that I give um, and I'm happy to answer it. So yes, a literary agent does not make money unless they sell your book to a publisher. If you have an agent who is trying to charge you fees um, before they've sold your book, uh, run away, run away fast. <laughs> uh, we should be making money on book sales. So an agency, an agent works on commission. I work on a commission, typical agent commission on a domestic project, meaning something that's sold in North America is 15%. Anything sold in foreign territories in translation overseas is 20%, as are things like audiobook sales and um, movie and TV sales. That's all an agent commission would take 20%. So you, my 20% or my 15% is taken out when the publisher sends a check. So you're signing check. The check comes to the agency. The agency um, puts that check into an escrow account and uh, takes out their 15% cut and sends the rest to you. So we don't get paid until you get paid. Excellent, okay. Final question is from Natalie uh, Metropolis. This question pertains to a nonfiction picture book series. Okay. One, should I send the query after the first book is completed? Mm -hmm. Two, should my query focus on the first book in the series, then identify some of the other books that I intend to include in the series, or should the query summarize the series? I think that the query should pitch, uh, pitch the first book in the series and mention briefly other potential books in the series and the direction that you can see that series going. Oftentimes editors will love the idea of a series but also have ideas for their own direction. So allowing it to be a little fluid is definitely a good thing. So pitch that first book because that's going to be your strongest concept and tell people it's a series and, and you should be in good shape. Okay, great. So the rest of you, I'm sorry we couldn't get to everybody, but please know that you can either send your questions directly to me and I can get them to Danielle. We'll work that out um, and we will move on to the next phase. Okay, excellent. Next phase is workshopping. Um, so we're going to do the hook workshop and what I've put, I know it's a lot of words on the screen, but I've put the fiction, um, the fi I'm pinching with my fingers, I put the, the, the fiction hook um set up there for you and if you're doing nonfiction, i've put some pointers for you to remember when you're working on that so feel free to plug in your information hack away at it for a little while maybe i don't know what do we think sheila like 10 10 minutes is that too long too short let me think i, th I think well, let's try 10. let's try 10 and if you're done before that start waiting or something yeah. do it that way okay great so have fun. And yeah, and if you have questions about this, shout and I can talk to you. Through. Yeah, we can do that. Mm -hmm. I'm going to get some water. I'll be back. Yeah. Okay.
Got about three minutes left. Danielle, while people are finishing up, uh, do you want to keep sharing the screen? How do you want them to, ident to um, indicate whether they like to workshop their piece? Uh-oh, are you muted? There I'm you go. Now. There we right. go. Um, that's a good question. Uh, they can... I, I'm new to the workshopping scenario, so I'm open to suggestions. But... Um, so maybe maybe just if you're interested in workshopping, we'll do the same thing as with um, the Q and A. Just pop your name mm -hmm. to the chat, and we'll go that way. Okay, perfect. Okay, <laughs> we have a lot of uh, already <laughs> interested. Okay, fun. I love this. Yeah, um, it might be nice though to yeah. uh, so you can see their faces. Yeah, maybe let me, let me stop. Okay, there we go. Okay, so uh, I'm gonna call your name out and unmute you, and then you can say hello and do your thing. So we have first, uh, let me hang on. <laughs> there are a million of you. Hold on. Um, okay. So, Zulika, where are you? Wave at me. I'm gonna unmute you now. Okay, go ahead. Hi, Danielle. Hi. This is for a nonfiction book. This, this book will make those who have lost a spouse at a young age feel seen and will appeal to people who could relate to It's Okay to Laugh, Crying is Cool Too by Nora McInerney. Mm -hmm. I think that's great. I think that's great. Could you read it one more time for me? Sure. This book will make those who have lost a spouse at a young age feel seen. Mm -hmm and will appeal to people who could relate to It's Okay to Laugh, Crying is Cool Too by Nora McInerney. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I like that, I like that. And I, the, the part about making people who have lost a spouse at a young age feel seen is great. It almost feels like it's, I almost feel like I want something ahead of that as well, more of a statement of, um, this is a book that will so it will make them feel seen but i feel like i also want to push you to look for even more of a purpose within that if that makes sense to strengthen that that purpose statement of what the book will do i think that a, making a, a reader feel seen who's had that kind of loss is very very important and i think that that's a good thing to put in there but i think i want to make the promise even stronger so i would say keep working with it and keep working on honing in on what is that promise what what will this book do maybe that the other book you're referencing doesn't do right what is what is new about this book and fresh that will bring readers to it so keep that's a good start keep working on it and just strengthen that promise statement and in nonfiction, i talk a lot about promise statements right make make the promise strong thank you welcome okay dan you are on hi 
Um, thanks for uh, doing this. Um, My pleasure. Mine's kind of a challenge because it's a collection of short stories rather than a novel. Um, but I tried to summarize it like this, um, or give the hook like this. Um, a series of residents of a lower class, semi-rural town must each quietly grapple with their own personal struggles, from money and health care to challenges to their very identities and more. Again and again, these characters must choose between morality and survival in a town where without one, the other is hollow. Dan, you nailed it. That was <laughs> fantastic. That was really, really good. You totally nailed it. That's great. I, awesome. I completely understand the vibe of it. I know what the themes are. I know what's going on. That was wonderful. I, I have no, I, I, I can't pick at that at all. That, that was great. Well, then I'm, I have my hook. I'm going to use it. Thank you. <laughs> you got it. Go forth. Go forth. Thanks. <laughs> nice job, Dan. Okay, next we have Leanne, who I'm about to unmute. There we go. Nope, wait, I didn't get Leanne. Hold on. I was jumped screens. There we go. Leanne, can you hear us? Yes, hi. Sorry, I don't have the camera on. It's not working for me. That's okay. So, um, I'll just get right into it. Uh, the re it's a fiction novel. The rebellious princess of Galatia is forced to marry a foreign cold-hearted prince to put an end to the devastating war between their countries. Mm -hmm. Can you read it to me one more time? Yes, the rebellious princess of Galatia is forced to marry a foreign cold-hearted prince to put an end to the devastating war between their countries. Mm -hmm. Okay, I think that that is good and you're off to a good start. I think that we, so we've got the princess, we've got the war. The one thing I'm not getting is what she wants. I mean, we know that the stakes yeah. of the final battle are, are saving the country, right? But also, there's, I know that there's something that only she wants that is outside of that final battle. Mm -hmm. And that is a key, a key part of that hook, right? And that's a key part okay. of getting someone to understand what makes your character tick. So, so think about what that part of her is and try to work that into the structure that you have already. And uh, it right. should be in really good shape. All right, Great. thank you. Welcome. Thank you. Okay. Holly, you are next. Hello, Danielle. Hi, Holly. How are you? I'm good. Okay. okay. Holly is a drug addict married to Lauren, an alcoholic. She must navigate the uneven various lifestyle choices and terrain of addiction, homelessness, jail time, and summer carnival work, as well as manage to survive the domestic abuse at her husband's hands and save her marriage too. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I think that that's good. Can, you, can, can I ask you to read it one more time? Sometimes I need yeah. it close. Okay. I scribble. <laughs> okay. Okay. Holly is a drug addict married to Lorne, an alcoholic. She must navigate the uneven terrain of addiction, homelessness, jail time, and summer carnival work as well as manage to survive the domestic abuse at Lauren's hands mm -hmm. and hopefully save her marriage too. Yeah, yeah. So what she wants is to save her marriage. That's her, you would say that's her want? Not die. Not die, that's a good, <laughs> that's a good want. Okay, stay alive, save the marriage, good. Yeah. Um, I'm also wondering, I like that. I'm also wondering because it's nonfiction, uh, in nonfiction um, summaries, there's a little bit more room to pull in themes, and I think that you you definitely have that going on here. So I would I would not be afraid to work with that, right? That it's that it's a novel that deals with themes of addiction and recovery and abuse. I'm uh, not a novel. I'm sorry, a, a, a narrative that deals with themes of addiction, reco uh, recovery, and abuse. I would. I. It's okay to lean into those themes when you're dealing in a nonfiction way. Thank you. You're welcome. Wait, I can't hear you, Sheila. Oh. Are you on? Oh, there. Your voice went away from me. Oh, minute. I'm sorry. Oh, that's crazy. Johnny's on. Okay. Yeah, I'm on. Yeah. I'll, 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 Hi. Yeah. Uh, hey. Hello. This is for a, a novel. Um, 
An incompetent electricity thief must balance his family's safety with his desire to resist the powerful corporation that threatens to upend his way of life. Yeah, electricity thief. Is it a, is it a fancy? What are, it's like, a, like a sci-fi yeah. kind of dystopia kind of deal. Yeah, yeah. And I'm going to ask the same question of you that I asked a few queries back, which are, is there any, this is, it's a good start. It's really strong. You guys are all really good at this. I am, I would just say, is there a way that you can give us a little bit more on him? Like what kind of, what kind of personal demons is he battling? What kind of, basically, now that you've done this good work, what's the greatest fear that he's going to have to face, right? What, what he, what's he have to, going to have to go up against? See if you can find a way to also incorporate that in. Um, that would give me enough to make me go, ha, huh, let me scroll down and, and definitely cool. read some more. But knowing what, what, what his point is, knowing what his greatest fear is, gives an agent that extra, that extra motivation to feel interested. Oh, very helpful. Thank you. Okay, we have Rachel Kaufman is next. Apologies, my dog. Hold on one minute. Oh, Mr. Bingley. Uh, always with the dog. Okay. <laughs> no problem. Um, okay, so this is a children's picture book. And I have um, a barista octopus must help his friends with chores around the coffee shop, which leads to a sticky mess when he takes on more than his eight arms can handle. <laughs> Maybe that, <I'm> different. <laughs> so I think that sounds hilarious. Tell me a little bit about the theme. Is it is it about kids accomplishing goals? What do you what do you want the takeaway for your young reader to be? Cool. Yeah. yeah. So, so think about, think about that and try to incorporate that because a barista octopus, adorable, getting into hijinks, adorable, but for picture book, kind of like with nonfiction, you want, you have room to tap into that theme. That makes a lot of sense. Okay, great. Thank you. That was cute. Thanks. Okay. Next up is Darcy. Here you go. Hi, Danielle. Thank Hello. you for doing it. this um, for all of us crazy and desperate writers. Um, my hook is for fiction. It's Annie is a bitter housewife whose budding friendship with an active heroin addict forces her to resurrect her deepest secrets and at the risk of her marriage puts her in reach of the identity she's always wanted. Wow. Yeah, that's pretty great. I would say that you nailed that. I, I, she's got deepest secrets. She's got, she's got all kinds of problems. That was, that was wonderful. Good job. That, very strong. Very strong. I would just, the only thing I would say to you and to, to, I think it was Dan who, who are in the nailed it category. Keep, even try writing it. I would encourage you since you're doing it that well to write it in several different ways. Write several different versions of the hook and then try like plugging them into one another because you never know where it can go and it might end up deepening your statement a little more if you if you put that one aside and try a whole other one um you might just be able to uh to find a way to combine the two or get at something deeper but that was excellent that was really excellent okay thank you mm -hmm. danielle i just want to pause and ask you it's 8 17 and i want to make sure is there anything beyond the workshop that you would like to accomplish tonight no, I think I think that we're. I, yeah, I don't think that we're gonna have time to do summary stuff. So I think this. Okay. Is so you want to take a few more? Let me take a few more. Okay. Uh, the next person up is Maria. The other Maria. <laughs> Hi. All right. Um, so I kind of tailored um, this a little bit. Um, all right. So this is a young adult piece. Okay. Uh, vale seeks to redeem herself after a tragic attack leaves her family and her village in disarray. The solution is simple, recover the seed. But a centuries old secret forces her to choose between her own redemption and saving her community from the real monsters hiding in the shadows. Wow, you guys are experts at this. You, it's amazing. I'm sorry, but can I just say Chatham MFA alums? That's you what they you're killing it. You're absolutely killing it. I think that that was super excellent. I would totally read that book. That sounds really fun. Is that, it's a fantasy? Yeah, it's a fantasy piece. Yeah, sounds really good. I loved it. Good job. You nailed Thank it. you. 
Okay, let's see. I'm going to mute you, Maria. Um, we have a question from uh, Matthew who says, if there's still time, it's a proposal for a nonfiction academic book, but wonders if that will fit this workshop. For? A nonfiction academic book. To, to read the hook for? Yeah. Oh, I don't see why not. Yeah. Sure. Okay. Do it. You are unmuted, Matthew. All right, so um, yeah, so this book explores how we got to our contemporary level of cynicism and civil unrest, using literature and popular culture as a barometer for our current chronic public anxieties. Specific chapters on security, sexting, social media, and education will argue for how our collective sense of imagination has been lost. Mm. Yeah, I would read that book. I think we could all read that book right now. <laughs> um, that's, that's very interesting. I, I like it. And maybe because it is academic, my my usual mantra about the promise of it might not hold as, as tightly here, but I, I'm i always wanting more of that that promise, right? So, there are, so my question would be, there are a lot of people who are writing about this or who are doing this online and we can see short pieces about it. I want to know more about, again, what 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 makes yours special and why I should look at it all in one place right in in your book and if you can do that you'll be in good shape cool thank you so much you're so welcome thank you okay we got natalie up natalie you good to go can you hear me yes oh thanks i'm sorry if i was unmuted before when i was telling my husband to shush behind yeah. me <laughs> no um this is a nonfiction children's book um, this book will take children on an adventure to borneo with wildlife photographer tim layman to capture the photograph Entwined Lives, for which Lehman was awarded the Natural History, Natural History Museum's prestigious award, Wildlife Photographer of the Year. It will appeal to readers of National Geographic Kids and budding wildlife photographers. This is the first in a proposed series about the stories behind the photographs that have owned their photographers, the Wildlife Photographer of the Year Award. Uh-oh, Danielle, you're muted, hold on. Danielle. Oh. <laughs> no, this is not working. Ah! Sorry, oh, sorry. I don't know what okay, We got it. We got it. Okay. okay. So I, I did it. I muted myself because my dog was barking. Oh, okay. I didn't want that to, to interrupt. That sounds like a very, very, very cool book. I wonder if leading with, there are a lot of elements going on in there and, and we want to make sure that we're highlighting the, um, the most important parts first. And I wonder if talking about the basis of the, the photograph is a, a stronger leading point because that's the, that's the crux of what this is, is built around. So you okay. might wanna try to start there. Um, you could possibly start there with building, um, you know, this is a, this, this seminal photograph is very important. And so this is why this book is important and, and maybe lead with that uh, just so you're not, burying that need in, in a way. Mm -hmm. that, sounds but that sounds really great. And picture book nonfiction is a, a big deal right now. And it's having a very, very good moment. Publishers are very hungry for picture book nonfiction um, that look at different historical time periods or nonfiction biographies. So your timing is, is very, very good. You're, you're in a good moment. That's great. Okay, we have one more um, from Maria who originally said she had three, but I'm gonna tell her she can only do one. Okay. <laughs> Just one. Okay. Yeah. Uh, it's hard because I'm, I'm struggling with it. Um, a well-intentioned but ideological older sister must bury her ideologies as well as her sister to save her family's bad death from an unconventional burial that forever threatens to divide her from her family. I'm still working on it. <laughs> That's okay, work in progress. Can I ask you to read it one more time? Yes. A well-intentioned older sister must bury her ideologies as well as her sister to save her family's bad death from an unconventional burial that forever may divide her from her family. Okay, to save her family's, I kept hearing, is it bad death? Yes, it is. Bad There's death. quotation marks around it. So. Got it. Okay, yeah, it was tripping me up. I, 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 was, I was trying to figure out what it was. So we've got the first part of it, right? We've, we have someone who is dealing with her sister and she's, she has to bury her sister and deal with these inner things. So I think that that makes a lot of sense. But I do feel like your protagonist might be a little missing. 
I'm hearing a lot about the sister. I'm hearing a lot about the family, which is fine. That's part of your global arc. So you've got, you've got that part of it. And I think the reason that you're still, that you're, that you're, Got that look on your face is because you <laughs> you look worried uh, is because um because you want to give a little bit more of her what there's there's i'm sure that there's also something going on with her right and and find ways to bring that out a little bit more what is she most afraid of what does she most want in the world um and how is that a conflict for her in the story and how is she forced to face up to that and deal with it in the story thanks you're welcome. Okay, that is the last one we had in the chat. Okay. Wow, you guys are rock stars. That was amazing. That was so much fun. That was great. I don't know that I've ever had a group in a query letter class who rocked out the hooks in quite this way. Seriously, you guys get major, major points for this. I want to talk to Chatham people all the time. This is fun. Chatham people are happy to talk to you all the time. <laughs> Excellent. All right. Well, we're a little shy of 8.30. Um, unless there's anything else mm -hmm. that you want to share, Danielle, any last thoughts or last... Any last thoughts? Parting words, yeah. Parting words. Um, querying agents is a numbers game. Do your research. Do not be afraid to query widely. It's okay to pick dream agents and to dream about your dream agents, but don't put all of your eggs in your dream agent basket. It's, I, I think that literary journals are maybe pickier about simultaneous submissions. Um, maybe I'm thinking of a long time ago, but, but literary agencies are not. We expect you to query widely. When someone queries me, I expect that it's in the inboxes of 20 other people. That's okay. Make your A lists, make your B lists, um, get it out there and always be writing your next project. But just know that it's a numbers game and know that you'll hear a lot of no's. Um, mm -hmm. Try not to take them personally, if at all possible. And also know that it only takes one person. It only takes one person to say yes and then everything changes and you're you're off and running so in your darkest moments remember that it only takes one yes and um and it looks like you guys are all on an excellent path and it was so much fun talking to you tonight so so thank you and please i'm happy to answer the rest of the questions via email so um so you can definitely email them to me my email is danielle it's d-a-n-i-e-l-l-e -L -L -E, at upstart crow literary dot com and you can put in your subject line chatham uh talk and i will answer your questions i'm gonna unmute everyone so that we can all clap for danielle and she can hear it ready thank you danielle thank you so much for taking your time uh this time out of your your busy day um we really really appreciate this kind of nuts and bolts information i think that everyone here is uh is feeling energized and off we go to write our hooks excellent um, and i want to thank everybody for coming tonight and for being part of this um if you have any specific questions that you'd like me to pass on to danielle if you didn't get her email address although joe just popped into the chat um feel free to send it to, to me or to joe um you'll be getting a, a short survey um probably tomorrow sometime to ask you for some feedback about how these sessions are going um, there are four more this summer. You are yeah, welcome to come to all of them. So yes, thanks again, everybody. Have a great night. Thank you, everybody. You're amazing. Thank, Thank, you Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.